Good morning. We're making this recording today. This is Thursday, June 30th. We're a day late because of appointments, conflicting appointments on Wednesday. Normally we do a Wednesday recording. And we're going to be in Acts. We're resuming our study of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16 today. And so we want to go to prayer and ask the Lord to bless this study. Our Lord, we come to the Word and we ask you, Lord, that you, by your Holy Spirit, will teach us, will strengthen us, encourage us. And Lord, that we just not study with our understanding, but we receive in our heart, in our mind, in our life, and that we don't just be hearers of the Word, but doers of the Word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's blow the shofar and get into our study. Acts chapter 16, sometimes the, the shofar makes a different sound. Uh, I should have drank some water first. It works better when your mouth's not dry. Acts chapter 16. And this is uh, Paul and Silas uh, traveling and ministering together. It says, Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple there named Timothy, and this is when Timothy joins up with them. The son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. And Paul wanted to have him go on with him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem, that, that Jerusalem proclamation. And so the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And so Paul and, and Silas, uh, from this point on, they take Timothy along with them. And um, Timothy was raised uh, and had strong in Christian influence. His mother, Eunice, was a Christian. His grandmother, Lois, was a Christian. His father was a Greek and not apparently not a believer. And so uh, this is so important. Raise up a child in the way he should go, and when he grows old, and not depart from it. So Timothy is following this Christian education he received from his mother and is from, his, from his grandmother. And because his father was a Greek, and because, so he was a half-breed, he was half-Greek and half-Jewish, and uh, kind of like the Samaritans, and, and the Jews would normally avoid the Samaritans. So Paul asked that Timothy be circumcised so that there not be an uproar among the Jewish believers and say, well, you brought this half-breed in to minister with you. And, and so in those days, there were a lot of cultural things that had to be dealt with. And so Paul does this in wisdom. He does this so that Timothy would be accepted by the brethren. And then in verse 6, uh, this, is, this is a well-known portion of Scripture about the Macedonian call. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And after they had come into Mycenae, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So at this time, the Holy Spirit was leading them not to, not to go minister into Asia anymore, but to go up into Europe. And this is the beginning of ministry to the European continent. They had been ministering in the area uh, and the lower parts there and in what is now the area of Turkey. And after they had come to Mycenae, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing, to, passing by... Mycia, they came down to Troas, and a vision, a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and a man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Now this was a vision of the church in Macedonia, the believers in Macedonia asking for help. And after he had seen this vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, Macedonia was not only in the European continent, but Macedonia was to the northern part of Greece. And uh, so this is 
the beginning of the establishment of churches and the gospel in Europe. And then uh, in verse 11, it says, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course from Samothrace to the, and the next day came to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is, in the, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. So they arrived in Philippi as part of Macedonia, in Europe, in, in northern Greece. Uh, and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city to the river, riverside where prayer was customarily being made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now, this, this requires a little instruction. So they go to Philippi, and there's not a synagogue there. Remember, the apostles, when they first, when they began ministry, they first went to cities, and, and when they got to the city, they would go directly to the synagogue, because remember, the synagogue and the temple would have an open forum. They would have what we would call an open mic, and they, anybody visiting would have opportunity to speak. So they would have opportunity to speak in the synagogue and they would present the gospel of Christ. Now, this city had no synagogue. There was a Jewish law that if a city or, or a village had 10 men, 10 Jewish men or more, they were to establish a synagogue. And so apparently there, this city had very few Jews so there was no synagogue. On the Sabbath, these women were gathering near the riverside where they had gathered uh, customarily or regularly for prayer. And they sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. And she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and, and th when she and her household were baptized so that she believed and her household believed. She begged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And so she persuaded us. So they stayed and, and uh, that became a base of operation for them, staying and lodging and being fed there at Lydia's house. Now, another event takes place here and this can sound disturbing and you wonder why why did God allow this to happen? But listen, we'll, we'll see why. Paul and Silas are imprisoned in this portion of scripture. Now it happened as we went to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. Spirit of divination was a spirit that uh, would, would uh, be used by the devil to bring fortune telling uh, uh, seances, all this kind of spiritualist stuff. And and she brought her, it says, it says, spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. And this girl followed Paul and us, remember Luke is recording this, Paul, Silas, and Luke, and cried out saying, these men are servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. So she's, this spirit in her is, is not saying a false thing. See, even the demons know who Jesus is. And this spirit is declaring, these are servants of the Most High God who, who, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. Then Paul greatly annoyed. What annoyed Paul is that this demon, this demon was not announcing and inviting people to get saved. This demon was mocking and saying, oh, these are, these are servants of the Most High God that are kind of come and try to bring the message of salvation to you. And it was done in a mocking way. And Paul was annoyed. Not only was it mocking, but Paul was annoyed that he didn't want a demon proclaiming truth. That was, that was uh, an abomination. And so Paul became greatly annoyed and turned to the Spirit and says, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of her. And he came out of her that very hour. So at, at, that, at that declaration in the name of Jesus, the spirit has to go. These spirits have to flee at the mention of the name of Jesus. That's why we're not afraid of the spirit world. We can take authority in Jesus' name. These demonic spirits, unholy spirits, 
have to flee. They have to stop tormenting and get out in Jesus' name. But this is the problem. She was a slave girl owned by slave owners. She had this spirit of divination in her. And remember in verse 16, it says, she brought her masters much profit by her fortune telling. And so the spirit came out of her, but when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, it was all about money. It was all about making profit by this demonic spirit in this girl that brought them money through fortune telling. And they seized, they, are, they grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them out into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. Most of the people in that city, remember, were not Jews and they're bringing uh, persecution or ac uh, accusation against Paul and Silas, uh, first of all, for being Jews. And then it says in verse 21, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive and reserve, observe. So they were, they were Gentile Romans, who Romans, by the way, were mostly uh, heathens and pagan worshipers. And they said, these, these men are teaching something that's not loss, lawful for us to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them. And, and this is, when, when people oppose the gospel of Christ, it's not hard for them to find people that they can get stirred up and bring opposition. We're living in a day and an hour right now uh, when the church is blame, being blamed, Christianity is being blamed by, by people that are not saved, that are not Christians, for everything they don't like that's going on in the country. It's even happening here in America. It's happening in every country. Christians are being blamed. Jews are being blamed, and Christians are being blamed. When people oppose the word of God, they want Christians and Jews to be silent. And the magistrates tore their clothes off and commanded them to be beaten with rods and when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely, like they were some kind of uh, mass murderer or something. They were treating them as terrible criminals. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their, fastened their feet in stocks. So they were, they were making sure, not only were, were, were Paul and Silas arrested, and, and punished, beaten with rods, received many stripes. Then they're put in prison and they're held like the most notor notorious criminals. And we wonder, why does God allow this to happen? But then look what happens in verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. <laughs> they were not discouraged in their walk with God. They had just been beaten, punished, unlawfully beaten and thrown in prison and their feet are fastened in stocks so they can't get out, they can't even walk around and they're singing hymns, they're praising God. And as they're praising God, the prisoners were listening to them. So this, this, this testimony, this was a testimony. Paul and Silas, the prisoners knew they had just beat, been beaten and they see them fastened in a way that other prisons, prisoners weren't fastened. And it says, suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. God likes to shake the things that are not of God. He likes to shake things that are ungodly. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were loosed. Not only did the doors uh, fly open, but all those that were chained, they had chains loosed and the keeper of the prison. So, God releases, opens the doors, and releases the prisoners. But they didn't move. They stayed put. And the keeper of the prison, awake, a prison awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposed, supposing the prisoners had fled, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. He knew, he knew uh, if he didn't kill himself, he was going to be killed by the leaders. And Paul called out with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are we are all here. So here's the all the prison doors are open, all the chains are loose. 
and Paul and Silas and all the prisoners are sitting there in the prison. They said, we, we haven't escaped, we're still here. Don't hurt yourself, do yourself no harm. Then he called for a light and ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. So the, the, the jailer is overwhelmed by what happened. The, the earthquake wakes him up. He sees the prison doors open, all the chains are loose and he brings a light in he goes, he goes immediately to Paul and Silas's cell. He knew that they were at the root of what God had just done. And he brought them out and said, Sirs, what, what must I do to be saved? This is a very, a very famous line from scripture. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? This is still happening today. Uh, just a few months ago, we had a man in our church that was out working in front of his house and one of his neighbors uh, in a wheelchair came up and said, you're a, you're a godly man, aren't you? And he said, yes. And then the neighbor asked, what do I need to do to get saved? So this is still happening today. And then this brother in the church was able to lead him to the Lord. So they said, believe on the Lord. This is the response of Paul and Silas to the Philippian jailer. jailer. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> excuse me believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved you and your household now this is so important all you have to do is believe they didn't say well you got to go through a series of classes or you need to get baptized first they said if you want to be saved you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ then they add something to this verse Paul says you will be saved and your household. There is salvation for our families. There's salvation for our household. So once you believe on the Lord, you need to begin praying for your family, for your, for your household to be saved, for your family to be saved, to come and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now, this is an important sequence of events here. We need to have this doctrinally correct. You have to, baptism doesn't save, so you have to believe on the Lord first, and then baptism is a public confession of your faith. You're, when you're baptized, you're saying, the Lord has washed my sins away. I've died to my old way of life. I've been buried, and then I rise up out of the water and new creation in Christ. So the symbolism of baptism is a testimony to all that you are now a believer in Christ. We'll get into that more in another study. Now, when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his house. And so there was not only uh, were Paul and Silas liberated from the prison, but the keeper of the prison, the jailer, and all of his house became believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, this, is, this is Gentile salvation. These are people that are not Jews that are becoming believers in Christ. And then in verse 35, now, is it possible? Can you see here how it's God's plan? Even when Paul and Silas are beaten with rods, they receive many stripes on their back, they are thrown in prison, they're secured in the, the inner prison, their feet are put in stocks. All of this is happening. You think, why would God allow this to happen? Then the earthquake, then the, the, the doors are open, the chains fall off, and the, the jailer says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved and your household. Can you see the love of God in this. God cared so much for this one soul and his household, his family, his friends, that he allowed Paul and Silas to go through this suffering, to be put in prison, so that this, this jailer, this Gentile, and his household will come to the Lord Jesus Christ, will be saved. Sometimes things are happening in our life and, and they're terrible. And we think, why, why is this happening? And I know you've said this before, why is this happening? I'm a believer in Christ. God, where are you? Why are you allowing this to happen? And then a lot of times we add to that sentence, 
uh, what good could possibly come from this? And then we see a salvation. We see people get saved after what after we've gone through something terrible. Uh, so in verse 35, and when it was day, the magistrates sent for the officers saying, let those men go. And so here's something that happened. Paul and Silas, and then here Paul is a Paul was a Roman citizen. He was a legal Roman citizen, and he had just been uh, punished without a trial, uh, unjustly. False accusations were brought against Paul and Silas. They were punished. They were thrown in prison, and they're Roman citizens. Now the magistrates, the leaders of the city, were in big trouble now uh, with Rome. They were in trouble with uh, the leadership of Rome for doing such a thing to a Roman citizen. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul saying, the magistrates have sent to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. In other words, the jailers uh, saying, the magistrates said, you're free to go. Uh, they want you to leave the city. They, they wanted Paul and Silas to depart uh, quietly and not make a big fuss and not bring trouble on their office, on their position. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned Romans, uncondemned Romans, and have thrown us into prison. Now do they put us out secretly? Paul says, no, indeed, let them come themselves and let us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they heard that they were Romans. And they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them, to depart from the city. So they went out of the prison, entered the house of Lydia, that's where they had been staying before, the seller of purple. And when they had seen when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So they didn't depart the way the leaders of the city wanted them to depart. Uh, they had been uh, wrongly accused, they've been falsely accused, they've been in prison, they've been punished, they've been beaten and they were Roman citizens. None of this was supposed to happen unless there was a, 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 a trial and they were found doing some wrong and they had done no wrong. And so that's the end of the chapter, chapter 16. But the big lesson here is that when you're going through something difficult, keep your Christian testimony. Paul and Silas, they had just been beaten, mistreated, thrown in prison, and they're in the prison, they're singing and praising God, and all heard this. This was the testimony of the Lord. No matter what happens in our life, we're gonna remain faithful to the Lord, we're gonna continue, we're gonna continue to praise him, we're gonna to continue to give him glory, that that will be a testimony for all who don't believe. Let's close in prayer. Our Lord Jesus, we come to you now. There may be somebody listening to this teaching today, this chapter, and wondering, oh my, the love of God. God would allow such a thing so that this jailer and his family would be saved. Sometimes Christians will go through difficulties so those that don't believe will see the power of God, will see the, the prison shaken by an earthquake. Uh, sometimes things are happening that we don't understand. God's ways are far above our ways. Lord, we pray, if there's one listening this chapter, that they will believe on you. Just like Paul said, simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, you and all your household. And Lord, we pray for the church that we will continue. In these last days, things are getting difficulty. Persecution is being increased upon Christians right now. It's not a time for the church that, to be silent. It's not a time for the church to decrease, but to increase in testimony, in the name of Jesus. We pray for boldness to declare your name, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you. Continue to be in prayer. We'll have another Bible study on Saturday. And so keep this ministry in prayer. We, just, we don't ask for your offerings. We just ask that you pray for us in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.